Hello and welcome to Global Healthcast, brought to you by Global Health Press. In this podcast series, once a week, we bring to you news and views about public health, vaccines and vaccination. I am Joe Schmidt. I am in Singapore today. And with me, as always, is Dr. Melvin Senecas. Good morning to Switzerland. Good morning, Melvin. Good morning, Professor Schmidt. Oh, good afternoon. <laughs> good evening. <laughs> or whatever, right? Depending on where you are right now watching or listening to us today. Good morning, Melvin. I guess uh, you're in Switzerland, right? And for me, it's almost evening. Yes. And here are the topics today. There is a first influenza vaccine approved to be self-administered. We speak about waning protection from Mpox vaccine, travel that may protect against aging, elimination of leprosy in Jordan, And then we have two short pieces on a drug against respiratory syncytial virus and reduced dose PCV in a clinical study. Let's start. And Melvin, you have the first story on self-administered influenza vaccine. Yes. So the US FDA announced that it has approved a self or caregiver administered flu mist, making it the first flu vaccine that does not have to be administered by a healthcare provider. And in a statement that provided by the FDA, they said that MedImmune, the maker of Flumis, plans to offer the vaccine through a third-party pharmacy. People interested in the self or caregiver option will complete a screening and eligibility assessment when they order the vaccine. And if the eligibility is established, the pharmacy writes the prescription and ships the vaccine to the person who placed the order. Then the vaccine is given at the household's con um, convenience. And the FDA recommends that a care caregiver administer flu mist to those aged 2 to 17 years old. And so I think this is really exciting, right? Because this is the first time that people can actually um, vaccinate themselves against flu. Excellent. This is the first in history, right? Yes. Self-administered vaccine we haven't had. And this is, this is really a great advancement. Isn't there any safety concern or isn't there a concern that people write in their vaccination card that they got the vaccine, but they didn't? Yes, and I think that's the reason why they have this screening first, right? So I, I guess in, in this screening and, and eligibility assessment, they try to elicit these questions and see whether the patient could potentially um, be not honest, right? Maybe they order the, the vaccine and just waste it. But I guess this is something that the, the company is also going to be following up to make sure that this concern is addressed when the FDA asks them a year or two from now what happened to the vaccine, right? Yeah. I mean, it makes no sense to write down on your vaccination card that you got the vaccine when you did. Why would anyone do that? It's mm. different from the COVID times when being vaccinated allowed you to go to a restaurant or to the movies. So yep. this is a different situation. If you're stupid enough to get the vaccine and then not use it, what can you do, right? It doesn't hurt anybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Melvin, you have a second piece, and that is uh, um, waning protection from MPOX. What is the story here? What did you learn from the article here? Yes, so um, the Geneos vaccine wanes significantly over the course of a year. Um, And so some experts are raising new questions about just how protective this vaccine can be and just how protected the vaccinated people are against reinfection and if booster doses of the vaccine are needed among um, those at risk, right? So Gineos developed in 2019 by Bavaria Nordic is supposed to be administered as two doses given 28 days apart. Um, this live attenuated vaccine virus um, targets smallpox and other orthopox viruses, including mpox. And efficacy estimates for two doses of the vaccine ranges from 36 to 86%. And so huge range depending on the, the population, depending on the study you're looking at. But having just one dose, which many Americans were given as a dose sparing method in the early weeks of the 2022 outbreak is only about 58% effective in preventing mpox according to this recent study in the British Medical Journal. And so I think the, the implications of this is really they're studying whether um, you may need to have a, a booster dose in, in the future for those who are really at high risk for MPOX. 
even though you were given the one dose only in, in the early um, early weeks of the outbreak in 2022. So my one question, where I'm not sure if this is addressed in the study, is there like with COVID, there is waning protection, but you are still protected from severe disease and death. Have the authors looked into that as well? Is there still a benefit if you got vaccinated versus unvaccinated subjects? Well, benefit is there, right? I think there's no question about that. But the 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 thing that they studied is really looking at the neutralizing antibody titers, which we know in this case is really the protective um, component of the vaccine. And and so they they this is what they looked for in in this particular study. Ah, okay. So it's an mm. immunogenicity study, basically. Yes. Yep. Yeah, and there was no correlation with CD4, CD8 cells. That is no. interesting to read because that was different with COVID. Mm -hmm. Yep. Because there the T cells persisted for a while, whereas they did not here in this study. Very interesting. And Melvin, you have something that I like very much, which is travel to be a defense against aging. I like that because I travel a lot. <laughs> Yes. So for the first time, this is an interdisciplinary study that applied the theory of entropy to tourism, right? So it's very theoretical, so I have to say that now. Um, but the finding that travel could have positive health benefits, including slowing down the signs of aging, is really, really interesting. And uh, in this study that was published in the Journal of Travel Research, they, they made this case. So entropy is classified as the general trend of the universe towards death and disorder, right? And the entropy perspective suggests that tourism could trigger entropy changes where positive experience might mitigate entropy increase and enhance health, while negative experience may cont contribute to entropy increase and compromise health. And so aging as a process is irreversible. We know that, right? While it cannot be stopped, it can be slowed down, according to the author of this paper. So the, the researchers noted that positive travel experience could actually enhance individuals' physical and mental awareness through exposure to novel environments, engagement in physical activities and social interaction, and the fostering of positive emotions. And these potential benefits have been acknowledged through practices such as wellness tourism, health tourism, and yoga tourism. And tourism isn't just about leisure and recreation. It could also contribute to people's physical and mental health. And I think I, I, it could be uh, uh, something that people study really in the future with maybe a randomized controlled study or something, right? But I, I think this is really interesting because for me at least, I, I feel that when I travel, I, I am forced to be alert. Right. I am forced yeah. to be more active. I am forced to be uh, looking at the surroundings and really have my mental equities in check. Right. And uh, I, I, I think it makes sense. It makes sense uh, because you also prepare for your travel, right? You you read mm -hmm. what you're doing, what you're going to see. You may review the history of the place. So many things you do in preparation. Now, with regard to evidence grading, this is hypothesis raising, right? Yes. So there the next no... thing would be okay. yeah, to find any evidence from an observational study. And then in the end, one would need a proof of concept study. I'm, I mean, you cannot double blind, randomize, uh, um, tell people to travel or to make yoga or to go to the gym once a week, yes. right? That yep. is something not possible. And there is no blinded um, evaluation possible. But maybe there some researchers find an opportunity to design an observational study where different type of interventions like sports and travel are compared and the outcome is compared. Mm -hmm. Something like this. Yep. I like to read this and I guess I can continue to travel. It's no, It's good news, no bad news, right? Yes. Now, this is also very exciting, eliminating leprosy. This is really something. And this from Jordan. This is really congratulations to the country. Well done. What is the story, Melvin? So the WHO congratulated the Kingdom of Jordan for becoming the first country in the world to be officially verified as having eliminated leprosy. And leprosy, also known as Hansen's disease, is a chronic infectious disease caused by mycobacterium leprae. 
It primarily affects the skin, peripheral nerves, mucosal surfaces, or the upper respiratory tract in the eyes. And if left untreated, leprosy can cause permanent damage to the skin, nerves, limbs, and eyes. And early diagnosis and treatment can really prevent disability. This is significant. Uh, it marks a new era in global public health efforts. And Jordan has not reported any um, local cases of leprosy for over two decades now. And this is a testament to its strong political commitment and effective public health strategies to eliminate the disease. So I think this is really good. And hopefully this will inspire more countries to um, have better surveillance, have better systems in place to track and uh, uh, make sure that leprosy in their country does not spread further or there will be no other uh, newer cases. I guess I cannot comment more, but just say congratulations to this wonderful country. Well done. Yes. Melvin, we have two more pieces, and one of them is there is a drug to treat RSV bronchiolitis, and I report about a phase three multicenter double-blind randomized placebo-controlled study that was conducted in China. And uh, it was in RSV hospitalized children, and they were randomly assigned to the drug in a two to one fashion to receive Ciresovir, 10 to 40 milligram per body weight or placebo. And um, it was administered twice daily for five days. And the primary end bit was changed from baseline to day three in disease severity, basically. And then I do not go through the different uh, results in all detail, just uh, to say that uh, the drug, that the medication was effective among the 244 participants. And uh, overall, it was well tolerated. And uh, there was nothing special to worry about. The one thing um, that that raised my eyebrow is that there were resistance associated mutations in 15 participants in the drug group. So this is something uh, that is certainly of concern. Uh, again, um, uh, this is a very encouraging study to begin with, and I think what needs to be done is then, uh, before a widespread use of this drug, one would need to make sure that that the drug becomes too resistant to mutations that make the drug resistant. So I'm not sure how to do this. It probably would be biochemical modifications of the drug, but imagine there would be a widespread use uh, RSV is a disease that catches all children up to age, I mean, 100% incidence, 100% of children have had it by age two years, wherever you are on the globe, you cannot escape it. And if you use Ciresovir in even just half of the world's birth cohort, it means there will be 100% resistance in no time. So I would worry about that. And that is my only safety concern. Any comments, Melvin, from your side? Yeah, I think this is really something that most, if not all, antiviral um, drugs need to worry about, right? I mean, we've seen this in HIV drugs, for example, although yeah. H HIV is different because HIV mutates faster than RSV. But I think it's it's a similar concept, right, that this should be monitored to make sure that it does not become a um, a bigger issue than treating uh, the patients itself. But I, I think the, the developers are already thinking about this. And as you mentioned, modifications, uh, adding chemical entities here and there could make the drug not, uh, could make the, the virus not resistant to the drug. So I, yeah. I, I'm sure they're looking into this. Yeah. But it's nice to read people are working on it, right? It is yes. important work and uh, we can congratulate the, the group for developing this drug and uh, I hope it continues and it won't be the last medication on RSV. Mm -hmm. All right, then uh, I have an interesting study uh, from Kenya where they used fractional doses of PCVs to vaccinate young children. They used the 2 plus 1 schedule of ESA PCV10 or PCV13, and they also had a biological endpoint, which was carriage. And I guess they did this in um, in uh, Kenya. And to make a long story short, 
a 40% dose of PCV13 was non-inferior for 12 of the 13 serotypes after the primary series, and all responders respondents were similar for all serotypes after the booster dose. And then if you use a 20% PCV13 dose and uh, 40%, um, th there may have been a difference for PCV10, uh, but there was no uh, difference to the, uh, no in non-inferiority to the full dose. Vaccine serotype carriage prevalence was similar across all PCV13 groups at 9 and 18 months of age. So this is, an, again, a good news because serotype-related carriage is a good marker for efficacy against invasive disease. Speak about meningitis, um, septicemia, and maybe even pneumonia. So this is really very good news. Uh, I guess uh, less than half the dose would be sufficient. The question then is, why do manufacturers use such high doses if they are not necessary? And the answer is, number one, you don't know when you develop the drug. You don't know which is the lowest dose that would work. So in your clinical development, you start with a higher dose, and then, if at all needed, you would taper down. But usually, you leave it as it is because lowering the dose is a new label. You have to go through the whole through the whole licensing process again, and that will be very difficult. So nobody does it. But in the end, for a country in a low income emerging market, it may be safe to use, let's say, half the dose of PCV13 and still have a non inferior uh, effect. But you can vaccinate twice as many children. So I think overall, this is very good news. And uh, I'm very happy uh, to read about this. And I congratulate here the researchers in Kenya. Very nicely done. Melvin, any views from your side? I think this is um, a, a good study, Professor. And this is not new, right? I mean, we've seen this in HPV vaccines, where initially it was three doses, and then it became two doses. And largely, this was because of the many studies done by investigators in countries, some of them supported by the company, some of them not. They were independent studies. And these studies showed that just giving two doses would be enough instead of giving three. So I, I, I think it's exactly what you said. The companies yeah. would start with the maximum dose because of course you want your vaccine to work and be immunogenic. But then eventually over time, if you see more and more studies showing that actually less could be the same, then this could be uh, submitted to the authorities to change the indication. But it's always yeah. starting up and eventually maybe going down. Yeah. And I guess it is, uh, it is really the right approach because you don't want a good drug to fail or a good vaccine to fail just because you didn't use Enough. the minimum dose that mm -hmm. was required for efficacy, right? So exactly. that, that would be a shame, right? Anyway, I uh, thank you very much, Melvin, for joining me today. We discussed the first influenza vaccine that can be self-administered. We reported about the waiting protection after monkeypox vaccination. We spoke about the theory that travel is a defense against aging. We congratulated Jordan as the first country to receive WHO verification for eliminating leprosy. We spoke about a new drug to treat RSV in a phase three study, and then we spoke about reduced doses of PCVs that may be non-inferior to the regular dose. Thank you very much for listening. It was great to have you, and I give Melvin the last word. Thank you very much, everyone, and stay safe.